Welcome to Quality Policing. I am Peter Moskos, and I am here back with William Gorta. Um, this is the second part of a two-part um, episode. I'll get right into it. You know, they said it couldn't be done. Were you surprised to see the effect of what you were actually doing? Stunned. And, you know, uh, again, Jack Maple, uh, we, we should talk about how low could it go. And we thought if we could cut robberies from about 100,000 to 50,000, you know, under 1,000 a week, and cut homicides to 1,000 for a year. You know, as Jack Maple said, you know, children will sing, school children will sing songs about you. You know, they'll build statues for you. You'll be on a stamp. You know, it was like, you know, it was, it was just going to be- will be like, crapping on your head. <laughs> yes. Well, I have a joke about that, but that's for offline. Um, anyway, um, uh, you know, the, you know, we did not believe it could ever go so low, you know, and I, you know, I'm so when I was seeing the numbers at the absolute lowest, it's like, could not believe it. Couldn't be happier, but couldn't believe it. Like, that is just, you know, more than we ever could have hoped for. So there was of a course, review. And then they decided it's not that important. Yeah, there was a review of Bratton's book on the Washington Post uh, recently. And the, um, it was weird because it blamed him for stuff that didn't happen uh, <laughs> that, that happened when Bretton was not commissioner. Um, but it ends with something like the line, and I'm, you know, I'm probably not getting the quote right. You know, the, the main thing about if you, if you must read this book, um, you know, please read about this era so we don't repeat it. And I just thought, wow, that's, a, that's an interesting take. Stupid. Huh. Um, no, I'm going to just say that's stupid. You know, because there were hundreds, no, because because Comstead, you know, and again, you know, comes the, the notion of accountability, the notion that we're the police and we're supposed to do something about crime, the notion that Comstead brought, and the 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 uh, uh, the mimicking of the of the uh, uh, methodology or the adoption of the methodology. There were hundreds of thousands of people alive today that wouldn't have been otherwise across the United States. Certainly, tens of thousands in New York, and they had the rest here as it goes worldwide, thousands upon thousands of people. And you're telling me this is a bad thing, right? I, I'm, I'm completely lost on that. You know? uh, a lot. So let me I, mention it. So some, some, people, some people say, oh, well, it was nothing you guys did because, um, you know, because it happened in All other right. cities. I'd like too. to be the guy here. I, why, I'm sorry, but, go ahead. Um, well, the, the argument is, um, you know, you know, crime went down everywhere is this is, is the simplistic version. Um, yeah. I, I, and I think what people forget is you guys took this on the road and you had people visiting um, and it wasn't that complicated. It was pretty easy, actually, to, to spread this idea of actually paying attention to crime. Right. But somebody has to be the vanguard, you know, crime went down everywhere because it went down here. You know, I've heard everything under the sun. It was. Um, it was uh, 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 Roe v. Wade. I mean, please, because uh, uh, abortion was already legal here. So just I, I don't even want to hear that one. Um, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? The, 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 the switch from crack to heroin, um, the, the, the stabilization of the outdoor drug markets. Um, well, drug uh, markets got uh, pushed inside. That was a big deal. I think that, right. that was that, that was the next step down the road. But that that reduces violence. Right. But that's right. That right. But that's that's because of what the police did. Mm-hmm. You know, that's not like the, we, it's not like they stabilized like the market stabilized. You know, <laughs> this is it was not the fucking Dow. The same. They went inside because they were pushed inside. The same way it's like, oh well, there were so many people in prison, even though they were starting to take people out of prison. So many people in prison. Well, how the fuck did they get there? You know, they just walked in, made a reservation. It's, it's just the fucking Attica Hilton. Give me a break, can huh? You know, I'll tell you, you know, all the excuses. And people have gone out of their way not to credit the police. And there's a lot of there's a lot of credit to go around here, but the police were at the at the vanguard. I was going to say at the tip of the spear, but that's probably a little too a uh, little too violent. But you know, because of Comstat, Comstat was also the big first success in Giuliani's administration. So all of a sudden now it became more important. It, it, but as it, as, as it did, everybody wanted to get on the board. Probation got on board. Parole got on board. The DA's office, because Jack called the DA out in, in a ComSat meeting. And that was almost a disaster, you know, because someone says, well, you know, I had this thing and the DA wouldn't co- uh, uh, prosecute. And Jack looks over and says, there's a representative of the, of the prosecutor's office here. Uh, the DA's office, uh, you want to address this? So, I, <clears throat> excuse me. So, 
but everybody wanted to share in the success. Nobody wanted to be the one throwing a monkey wrench in it. So, and again, you had you had your extra thousand, co- eight thousand cops from safe streets, safe cities. You had midnight basketball. You had community programs, and you know, again, nothing happens in a vacuum. But you know, you know, where did it start? Yeah, thirteenth floor police headquarters. Well, so one, I don't know if you know this because um, it's an obscure data point, but um. Uh, poverty actually increased in New York during the decade from 1990 to 2000. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, there were didn't more, know that. more young men in poverty, more people in poverty in general um, in New York City. So I, I don't think that is why crime went down. Uh, but no, I point that out because I, because you can do this without focusing on um, on other factors. Um, it's it's Thomas App saying, but you know, if you want to if you want to if you're worried about violence, focus on violence. Um, if everything just happens to lead you to support the pet program you've always supported, um, then maybe you don't care about violence. You know, and it's it's a big tent. There's room for everybody. There's room for ideas. But understanding that their uh, place in the queue and their time. You know, if you're you know if you're ahead of your time, you're still at the wrong time. So you know, you've described this period as the Camelot period. What do you mean by that? Uh, no, uh, I think it's, just, it's the Athenian period. As I described oh, it someone, in okay. Uh, is the guy with the idea counted. The idea was important. It's important to have ideas, which it wasn't before then, because under Kelly, I, people with ideas were problematic. You know, if I have, if I wanted you to have an idea, I will send out an operations order and you will have an idea. You know, the idea will be included in this. One will be assigned to you. But Brian, but it's like, do you want the ideas to bubble up? I mean, again, and this is all in relation to the other things going on in the police department. So Brad also then institutes this big re-engineering thing where, so he picks, I, I forget what it was, and I wrote the report, um, 10, 12, 20 areas. You know, one of them was supervision. One of them is integrity. One of them is whatever, you know. And um, so he signs some, some uh, you know, uh, uh, marker to uh, – to run the thing, but brings in people from the outside, sergeants, lieutenants, cops, and everybody's like, let's talk about this shit. And all of a sudden it's like building like internal ideas from all kinds of viewpoints. And then we did this gigantic report that was like 500 recommendations. But somebody says, okay, instead of like me sitting here in in, uh, my ivory tower saying, I have an idea. Instead he says, send me 562 ideas. And you what know, if they and, and what if they failed? Um, he wasn't see that was the thing about Bratton is is uh, uh, well before Bratton every pilot program would be this certain pro, pro, uh, program has uh, been deemed to be effective by whom the most holy demons. So what it is is like, but Brad was a guy that because you say you you had the liberty and he had the liberty to say no, let's punt this thing, you know, like we had an idea that. Gun runs, especially false gun runs, were basically like, there's a dice game. I called it in. The cops don't come. The next day I'm calling in a gun run. So we tried to do that as a measure of, you know, community uh, satisfaction with how the police were doing. You so know? proxy measure. If you get a lot of gun runs, yeah. the community ain't happy with our response. And it just wasn't, it didn't really show anything. So I was just like, fuck it. Let's not do that anymore. And it was just, and it was the whole thing. It's like, it's, it, it, it would be obvious now, you know, it's like, okay, I have this map full of dots. And next week I have a map with no dots on it or very few dots. Like I can see that this thing is just not. So let it go. And we were allowed to put things up and take things out. And Brent was like that too. Okay. We're going to do this. That's not work anymore. Let's not do that anymore. Let's not waste the resources or the, the, the bandwidth or the brain power on this. Just let it go. So that was that was a whole different animal. What um? What's an example? Of one of these things uh, that worked that surprised you? Um, trying to think now. There's, there was all kinds of all kinds of little things we did, and not us, but the, the department as a whole. It's like one of the things was, um, <laughs> and, and basically getting rid of guns was, you know, uh, requiring ID to get a summons. So you and me are rolling, playing dice, you know, I get made at you, I shoot you. But now what happens if we get busted for playing dice, if the cops come bust us for playing dice before this decision, 
Well, you know, what's your name? My name is Joe Bag of Donuts. What's your name? Uh, you know, your name is Fred Mertz. So, so they give you a summons, the bogus useless summons, they give it to you, and then they go. And now back to your play. We're both playing dice, and I have a gun. So you annoy me, and I shoot you. But once I know that I have to have ID, or I'm going to have to go in a police car to the station to be identified and thus be frisked, now it's like I can't play dice with this gun. So I leave the gun upstairs, uh, you know, and then you annoy me. I'm going to say, you wait right here. I'm taking the urinal up to the 19th floor of the projects. I'm getting my gun. I'm coming down and shooting you. So you have to agree to be shot. So it's, it's an entirely different, but it's just one simple little thing like that, you know? And I often say, you know, yeah, a murder postponed is often a murder prevented. Absolutely. You know, I'll be mad at somebody else or somebody will shoot me in the meantime. So that'll be fine, you know? But uh, or I get arrested for something else, and I'm doing six years, and I'm doing six years of state. So you know, I can't even remember you by the time I get out. Were you aware of any um, changes in prosecution of uh, illegal gun possession in, at the time? No, um, that doesn't. The thing that struck me about it, you know, was not the prosecution, but crime. You know, um, shootings fell faster than uh, gun arrests. The gun shootings didn't fall because of the the gun arrests. Gun arrests fell, it's almost like they were independent statistics. So, um, uh, and again, it was people keeping the guns inside. I don't remember much about gun prosecutions, to be honest. I'm not going to, I'm not going to pretend to profess. But people stopped caring. I mean, that's, yeah, it's not rocket science, as they say. Right. So one of the reasons, well, you know, the expression, I just want to go back before you ask that question. I just want to say, you know, when you're getting guns off the street, Getting a gun upstairs is the same as getting a gun off the street because the gun's not on the street anymore. You know, ideally you'd like to seize it, but that gun is off the street. So you've actually been effective. Hmm. Um, one of the reasons um, I think this era comes under criticism is because of the following era, which now get conflated. Because um, stop question and frisk got a little crazy in a bad way, um, starting around 2004-ish and going to maybe 20... 11, I guess, whenever that lawsuit was, uh, roughly. Um, just how mm. do I have the years wrong? Mm. No, it's not certain that, but there was always a, there was always a bit of a problem with stop and frisk or stop question and frisk. I mean, it just became abbreviated stop and frisk, which was wrong. But at any rate, there was there was a problem with this going back years and years and years. And in the early years of Comstack, because we were still on the second floor, um, a precinct commander, a borough commander, no, she, it was this um, second whip in the borough, was the, the borough XO, executive officer. Uh, Jack was, uh, was doing his thing and says, how come street crime, since disbanded, is able to make all of these gun collars and the borough anti-crime never makes it, doesn't make any gun collars? And this chief said, because the borough anti-crime respect the Constitution of the United States of America. So it sort of was allowed to devolve, you know. I mean, if you read Terry and you read DeBoer and New York law, it's like, okay, you know, this guy looks shady. This guy's a little shifty. That basically is like, you're not even up to the first tee. You're going to say, yeah, maybe I'd like to play golf. You know, and all of a sudden that became you're on a 19, you know, this guy looks shifty. And now all of a sudden, you know, uh, you're you're uh, getting an eagle on 18. It doesn't work that way. You know, you have to build a case. It's like you have to, you know, you make the observation, you keep an eye, you see what he does. It's not just like this guy looks shady, you know. And you have to articulate that reasonable suspicion. Well, there's, well. there's a bad there's a bad word. Articulate. Why? Because it didn't say because it doesn't say it has to be true. You have to be able to say these things. And that became, once you were able to articulate, to say, well, he had a suspicious bulge, he had the this, he they were off to his waist. Those all just became, and then eventually the police department gave him a checklist on, on the, the form. Or to gesture. Say to, right. So then they got their articulation thing. And even that's, generally speaking, not enough. You know, I mean, if you read Terry, it's like, you know, the guys, this year he looks shady and he's looking at oh, the that, window. I love that, I love that report written by, um, 
written by Detective McFadden. What a fab, because he describes three people casing a joint. And by the end of it, and it's, you know, type with two fingers and their X's and their few typos. <laughs> and, and, but you're like, yeah, they're going to rob that story. I'm, I'm convinced. Right. Huh? For the United well, Airlines office. See, what, I, what I would do if I had, you know, any rank in a police department, you know, and I like to think that if I'd stayed, what, I'd, what you know, I'd be you? chief by now, but I wouldn't have had to be there. But I would have, I would make every cop in the academy, maybe every cop in the police department now, write, read Terry and then write something about it. I don't give a fuck whether it's a sonnet, it's a short story, it's a report on it, it's, you know, but, you know, uh, you know, a, a rebuttal, whatever it is, you have to, I want you to think about this. That's all. Read it and write something. And then, and then I, that will deepen your understanding of it. You do have a literature degree from Columbia University, if I'm not mistaken. So. Yes, I do. <laughs> Were you, are you and willing also to, a, and a journalist of masters? But, are you um, are you willing to grade all of these? <laughs> well, you know, I think that at some level, you know, your sergeants and lieutenants ought to be able to do that. And if they can't do it, uh, then I really have to wonder about what we're doing here, because again, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's not a, a hard science degree, but it is a critical thinking degree. And you're supposed to be, as a boss, you're supposed to be thinking critically, you know. Um, what was the re- going? I want to go back to that story that I haven't heard before about um, we do constitutional, we respect the Constitution. Um, uh, so who was that during this era of um, of Maple? And, and like, how did that go yeah, over? Do you remember? That, what was the reaction? I had just stepped out to go to the men's room and... Uh, one of my sergeants came running out and says, Billy, you can't believe what just happened in there. And when I heard it, I says, okay. And Louis wasn't in that meeting. Louis had another meeting upstairs in his office and I had to go bursting into that meeting. And, and well, I, Billy, I, Billy Connors, the captain came out and I go, come here, come here. I says, this, this just happened. You know, he's got to get involved. And then there was some consultation and eventually, because also there was somebody from internal affairs there. It was internal affairs just to attend. So it was like, you know, I guess there was a, a meeting in the minds and they decided to say uh, the chief misspoke and, you know, whatever. But I don't know that there was any follow up along the lines of like, let's look at these 250s. I, I was never ordered to do get all the 250s and do a review of them, which would have been something you know, I certainly would have fallen to me. And d- did you feel overall that the um, going pushing the limits of the law and constitution was a, was pressure during this uh, during these meetings or how, what was the emphasis, the tone? See, I don't think the cops generally felt that way. I think the cops, once they were uh, emboldened, the shackles came off, whatever, whatever you want to call it, you know, I think they were sort of like in the whole rah, rah mode. Let's go fight crime. You know, once their mission was clear, because before that, you know, uh, you know, you were, uh, community people, you were, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, responsive, you were, you know, you see popular community ombudsman, give me I, whatever that means. And so this time it's like, no, and Brighton made it clear, you know, your job is to fight crime, disorder, and the fear of crime. Now go do that. So all of a sudden they're like, whoa, let's go do that. And there's overtime at the back end of this. Well, let's go. So now we be, they, a lot of it became an unstoppable force. But the problem is, it's not, it's, again, it's not the cop's fault. It's always the boss's fault. Who's supervising these people? You know, who's, who's turning them out there? You know, like, where are the sergeants? Where are the lieutenants? Like, you know, you know, let's get with the program here, you know? So, uh, but I didn't see, polit- I didn't see politics in this, but, you know, I may be, I may be biased. I may be blind to it. So, so this uh, Athenian period um, was surprisingly short. Um, Great. You know, the the popular quick version is, um, which I think is true, uh, Giuliani couldn't handle Bratton getting press, um, releasing some statements, two big egos, they conflict. And then Bratton gets his cover on the picture of Time magazine, says we're winning Ugh. the war on crime. Here's why. And uh, that supposedly was. And the, I, um, oh, yeah. And I have to I have a, a little backstory on that. So. After Miller resigned with his, uh, you know, uh, you know, they were good Nazis too, or loyal Nat, whatever. They, when they forced the deputy commissioner of public information out, this is John Miller. John Miller, and there was something about, you know, uh, some some remark about Nazis that, uh, uh, 
But anyway, they bring in Tom, what the hell is his name? Tom Kelly. And he was an old PR city, city guy, you know, various city agencies, a PR pro, you know, a guy who didn't really know what he was doing. So the Bratton interview is coming up and he keeps calling me over, you know, uh, you know, cause we was, you know, around the, on the other side of the elevators, but you know, can you come over? So it's like, I need this, I need this, I need these stats, I need these stats, I need this. and it's like, it's like really building up a lot of shit. And um, uh, so she says, "Let me ask you, Commissioner, is this guy gonna be? Is this gonna be on the front? Co- is this gonna be the cover of Time Magazine?" He goes, "Oh, my fondest dream." And then basically, he was out of work the next Monday. <laughs> Um, so what um, happened when uh, after well, what's the shakeup then? Uh, well, safer is the next uh, commissioner, right? Right, because well, uh, he wanted to bring a loyalist over, safer, who is you know tits on a bull. I mean, the guy, guy, the guy has yet to have an idea. But at any rate, so Timothy says, "I'm not working for this lightweight." So Timothy, get, you know, basically resigns slash gets fired. Maple wanted it. He wouldn't give it a maple. I think he offered maple another. Could have been first step, but but uh, income's safer and income is you know eh, here comes the march of the mediocrity. You know, it's like you know, you know. Adam Owen had already but, you know, feuded with him because uh, right. This goes back to that Harlem incident where the uh, so Adam got a fire truck for the police department saying if you don't want to go into to these scenes, I will. <laughs> and that didn't, and safer the time was out of the fire department, right? So. Yeah. But, you know, so, but, you know, these were, uh, uh, you know, but there just wasn't, so they, 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 nobody had an idea anymore. So let's just keep going back to the same idea. Let's keep squeezing this constat lemon because we keep getting juice out of it until eventually. And, and this is how you get into this uh, pressure to make more collars and pressure to do this kind of thing, because nobody, nobody's got a new thought. You know, Kelleher once said to me that, uh, um, you know, Braddon, he says, you know, as it was early on, he says, by the time he's done, he will have reinvented himself six times, he's, you, you know, and because Bratton was fast on his feet and he was an adapter and he could see what was needed at the time. The other guy was just like, just, just keep beating the same drum. And then came Carrick beating the same drum and then came Kelly beating the same drum. And there you are, you know. But, then, uh, you know. Um, and then, of course, it went, yeah, well, that, uh, it's, it's, it's a shame because that not only was it bad to all the people that were stopped for no reason, uh, but it really was a black eye to the uh, to good policing. And we haven't recovered from that era. Um, you know, and, and New York managed to reduce, and this was under Bratton's second term, but New, New York managed to reduce those stops and keep crime down and violence down um, because they stopped the stops they shouldn't have and didn't need to make. And they kept doing the ones they were supposed to make. Um, you know, now there's that basically are, no enforcement of anything. Right. Because, well, listen, are you going to get out of a radio conference your career? Somebody filming you and the next thing is, you know, you know, they're outside the Peter Moscow's residence uh, with the racist signs. You know, there was an old saying in the police department, you know, and none can deny it. It's like nobody ever got hurt for doing nothing. If you, if you, you don't know? work, you can't I'm not chasing the guys on the dirt bike. Yeah, I'm not chasing the guys on the dirt bikes. Go ahead, run down Park Avenue all you want. I don't care. But I'm not, I'm not A, running over a pedestrian, or B, having you run over a pedestrian, or three, you wiping out, or whatever it is, and somehow it's all my fault. So I, go ahead, have fun. You know, nobody ever got hurt for doing nothing. So how does that, either, how does that deteriorate, or if, if you were, um, if you were commissioner today, I chuckle thinking how much fun that would be for the rest of us. Uh, how, um, you know, how, yeah, you'd be. It wouldn't be fun for you because you'd be the first step. So too bad. <laughs> how um, how do you change that? Like what what did um you know what did any of those following commissioners do that was different from what had been done? Well, I think they. How does I yeah? How does the atrophy more... spread and start? Well, I think I I think that uh, uh, you know you have to. Reduce the fear level, and you got to get the cops on board. But first, you got to get the sergeants on board. To me, with the your your pardon me for saying this, is the most important job, perhaps in the world, but certainly in this country, is the police sergeant. Okay, they watch the watches, they make good cops, and eventually they get promoted. They make good lieutenants and sergeants, etc., and so forth. All right, you got to get the sergeants on board, 
And listen, this is your job. You took a note. You don't want to take, you don't want to do that. You know, I would fill up, I would fill up motor transport would be, would be the sergeant's retirement home until the guy got the guys I want in there. I, we have to do this. We got to, if you don't want to do this job, don't do it. But don't think you're just sitting here, you know, you know. So to me, let's get the sergeants on board. They'll get the cops on board. You know, I mean, and, you know, you may have to have your brat next shakeup. It's like, what are you doing here? Can you think of you a know, better way you, to promote other than civil service? Well, the, the uh, civil service promotion is fine in and of itself. The problem is the training. You know, they teach you how to write a, uh, uh, an unusual, an unusual occurrence report. They say this, they say that, they say this, they say that. Now get out your research. Congratulations. If they could take people, they could take people at random. Just say, everybody, let's attend to the job needs to be sergeants. Take everybody whose social security number ends with two. Now you're sergeants. If you train them the right way, you're going to have just as, just as good, if not better, than you have now. So a better way to promote, I don't know about that, but I know that once you promote, you know, and I just, you do need some civil service because they're going to, you know, they're, they're always going to take liberty and just fire people and all of that, you know, uh, and hi, there's always going to be some feather bedding and some um, um, nepotism. So civil service has its place. But the thing is, it's like, once I make you a sergeant, then I have to make you make you a sergeant. It's one thing to promote you. Now I got to make you a sergeant, you know. And the way the police department fails in, in its entire utterly is training. Now, training is expensive, you know. But, you know, you want, you know, like when I was a kid, you went through the you went to the range. OK, so you fired a target. And, uh, but, you know, you go through the fun house, you know, where you're in live situations, you know, where, where things pop out at you and do you shoot, don't shoot. Well, one guy in our company did one out of 30 went through there. And we were up there with a couple of other companies. So a couple of people went through and we watched. Well, you know, I watch television, too, you know, so <clears throat> it's not effective, but it's expensive. I got to take cops off the line to do this. I have to have trainers. I have to have venues. I have to have curricula. I have to have all of these things. But if you, if, if you want the cops to stop fucking up, well, here's how you do it. That's generally why things are, are, are the way they are, is people are cheap. They don't want to pay for it, hmm. you know? You know, a lot of that's, um, I'm interested in this idea of sergeant training. Let's, if you were at the academy doing sergeant's training, what, what would that curriculum look like? I've never actually thought of this before. Well, I'm, I'm only heavily on leadership training and situational, you know, like they show you a film and this something happens. And then, then the, just like, it's a black and white film, at least when I was there, you know, color had been invented by then, but uh, it was a black and white film. And there's some scenario comes up and then the, the, the music and the guy's face goes, it's your move, Sarge. You know, but you have to do more than that. You have to get much more interactive. You have to teach them leadership. Again, make them read things, God forbid. Um, you know, make them understand things that this is not, you know, the police department in many ways, it, there's some calling to this. And by taking a sergeant's test, and that's the other good thing about the civil service, by taking a sergeant's test, you have said, I am different from others. I don't want, I want to do this. It's a self, there's a self-selection process. Well, if you want to do this, well, then you have to do this. Maybe you train them beforehand. And only if that, then, then we give the civil service test. Only these, I don't know the answers, but I know, I, I don't even know the questions yet, but I do know that we need to find out the questions and then get to the answers. Because leadership, the whole thing, but, you, but by taking that, putting that number two pencil on that paper, you've said, I want to, be in charge. Well, guess what? Now you're in charge. Now you're not hiding behind the skirts of anybody else. Now you're in charge and deal with it and lead these people. Don't, so you just don't read this. You're not, a, it became the sergeant's rank devolved to the point of uh, you were like a senior cop or a cop with privileges. You know, you got to go to meal on time. Everybody else, you know, they were on their own. You know, uh, my father, Lord of Mercy, he used, to, he used to say, like, the police department. You know, he, you know, he was born in 37, but, you know, the police sergeant was like the czar of Russia, you know? I mean, there were times in the 44th precinct where I was the highest ranking member of government available when I was a sergeant. So Friday night in the ghetto, who's, who, who outranks me? I decide who's going to jail, who's married, who gets to stay in a house, who gets on the subway for free. I have to decide all these things, you know? So to me, it's like you put your fucking head on square and you make these decisions. 
And it's not a popularity contest. You know, I was always like, I don't care if the cops call me Billy. That's some, I don't care. But you know what my job is. And you know what your job is. And you know I'm going to make you do your job. I'm going to do mine. And that's part of that is making you do yours. That's, and, but you have to decide to be in charge. You have to decide to lead. You can't just say, okay, you know, all right. Oh, uh, you know, they want, uh, you know, I get to read the roll call out and I'm done. That, that's fucking bullshit. You know, but the sergeants, that's the fucking hinge right there. That's that's where all your money is. But, you know, you still have to train the cops, too, in, in ways that the sergeants can't do, in tactical training and stuff like that, and interactive training that, you know. Um, I you like know, to think optimistically that some of that has gotten better, uh, though that may just be. Uh, you know, but, you know, in, in, in my day, it was like you go to unit training, and put, put a cassette, in the, a video cassette in, and you watch this. You know, and then while you're reading the paper or you're getting your memo book up to date or whatever, you know, so it's like, yeah, OK, I got that. But, you know, and the training guy goes, check, he was here, check, he was here. It's like, I don't know. I mean, the other reason I, I say I think it's gotten better is simply because compared to other police departments, you know, they must be doing something right, because a lot of the New York NYPD does better than a lot of other departments. So I, I don't know what that is. And it's, you know, it's important to be self-critical and always get better. But there's also sort of sometimes I think, especially in the past few years, we forget that, you know, some departments, as dysfunctional as they may be, are, we said this um, earlier, you know, compared to other city agencies, it ain't so bad. Um, what is the magnitude? I mean, you know, I mean, and I understand they have a hard job, and I understand that there are um, limits on what they can do, but you know, certainly the, the Department of Health, the Mental Health, and Department of Homeless Services. I mean, you know, a, a lot of these things, it's a fucking joke. You know, these people should should be frog marched out in a square and shot for taking for stealing the fucking salaries. Um, that's also why I found the whole like, oh, we should the whole defund concept. Um, human resources, which is the umbrella department that funds everything you just mentioned, and I'm sure other stuff, I think their budget is 11 or $12 billion. Um, it's, it's almost twice the size of the NYPD. Where does that go? I don't know, but it would be nice when if someone answered the phone after 5 p.m., you know, that kind of thing. Right. Well, then you look at, you, but you look at the efficiency of the department. So the uh, school security officers were part of the Department of Education. And it was so bad, so dysfunctional, that they had to move them out, out of there. And same was the the, uh, the 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 traffic aides were part of the Department of Transportation. It's like, no, it's a, it's a disaster. And I was actually in, turn, in internal affairs for, uh, uh, you know, working in the chief's office for I think both of them. And it was like we were had to review the cases. Part of this was like, okay, look at these personnel folders. Are we going to take this guy and put him on trial here? We're we just going to say when I'm when I'm moving you, of course, when I'm hiring you. So it's like there was some. There were some real hoopals in the, in those agencies, and you know, you real the part of I'm education. Sorry? What'd you say? Hoopals. What the hoople? What's a hoople. It sort of speaks for itself. I can't believe okay. you've never heard that word. You talk no. about cops all the time, and you've never heard that word. I went over my head. I don't know. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, it's it's sort of it's sort of half derogatory here you know it's like in this case a real fucking hoople it could be go really fully derogatory to half derogatory okay All we right. were talking about cursing anyway. in foreign languages before <laughs> that was english <laughs> <laughs> but anyway uh you know but the department of education they they can't run a police department they can't teach children to read they they can't teach children the alphabet now they're gonna run a police department too i mean you know Come on. You know, it sounds great. You know, it's just, it's just stupid. Um, how much now you've told me in the past that, you you know, you didn't grow up saying, boy, what I, uh, I want to be a cop when I grow up. How do you sort of weigh that with the fact that, you know, you took an oath and there's a cause. And at some point, if the shit hits the fan, you know, you're, you're, you're putting your, you know, how, how do you deal with, how do you mentally or something? I don't know. Well, you know, I, I took an oath. I took an oath. That's it. I went to Catholic school, you know, but, you know, I put my hand in the air and that's that, you know, and, and uh, uh, you know, otherwise I wouldn't have done it. But, uh, uh, you know, but when the time was up, when I was allowed to be freed from my oath, I gave, I, I gave up the oath willingly, you know. You know, uh, I was happy to uh, agree to spend my time defending 
the people of the city of New York. Like, I don't want to go into security work because I don't want to defend some fucking millionaire's money. You know, it's one thing if I'm work, if I'm protecting the public in general, and just and this day happens to be you, as opposed to you know I'm only I'm this guy's I'm this guy's um, uh, uh, private army, and I'm just doing it to protect him or his money. It's like yeah, that's grubby. Sorry, mm. can't do it. So, well, so um, why did you um, why did you? I believe it was twenty years and three days, if I'm not mistaken. Two, <laughs> two, and that was not my fault. Um, the time was up. I was very good at help finding people that I could help get promoted to very high ranks. I wasn't good at finding people that um, uh, uh, I could help get promoted to free to high ranks who would then promote me. So, and of course, part of the problem is you know you know I'm a bit of a mouth, and uh, you know you know I have some hoople tendencies myself. So. You know, I could see them say, you know, it's like, yeah. And I, I just figured I'm never going to get promoted, you know, or I'm going to get promoted so slowly it's not even worth talking about. So it's like, that was time, to move, time to move on. You know, and I was like that throughout my, uh, well, throughout my life, you know, I mean, I left high school after three years. Uh, I never made it more than two years in any place in the police department. You know, so when time's up, time's up. Got to go. You turn around, you look back and say, all right, that was a good run. And now I'm on to something else. And I was. So, uh, you know, it's just, it's, you know, I'm not, I'm not a lifer or anything. I'm not a believer. I'm not a true believer. I believe in what I'm doing, but I don't believe in this, whatever that is. So you then went into journalism after um, you retired, yes. right? Did, um, did yes, your indeed. I, how did your, did, did, did um, having 20 years in the PD make you a better journalist, better reporter? Well, as I, as I said in my application at Columbia Journalism School, you know, well, I didn't say that in quite, uh, uh, it was, later it became internet journals, but it's like, you know, it's the same job. Find out what happened, write a report. The only difference is my deadline is now because the chief's on the phone and wants to know what happened. So, you know, you, you're out there in the middle of the night, you're standing on one side of the barricade or the other, you're drinking shitty coffee, you're in the rain, and find out what happened, write a report. And we're done. So it, the, the jobs were remarkably similar, which is why cops and reporters are always at loggerheads, you know. But, uh, um, you know, I found it good. I didn't want to rely on my old police contacts because I wanted to, you know, and I didn't carry a gun, uh, you know, um, in my street reporting because I didn't, I didn't want to rely on the cop thing, you know, either the gun giving me confidence or giving me arrogance or, and I didn't want to rely on my police contacts because I want to say, I want to be able to do this job on its own. I want to be able to say, I did this job, not uh, not my retired Captain Shield or my Glock 9 millimeter. I did this job. So, you know, I tried to forge an independent path with it. Hmm. I mean, I had some insight, you know, no, you know, um, uh, one of the, the, the stories that uh, uh, it, uh, uh, a police gossip story that, that kind of like sealed the deal for me to get hired to post because they're on a try out there was uh, when Safer was retiring, um, he gave special assignment money to the guy who was the curator of the police museum, which his wife was the patron of. And I was the only one who caught that because the command was different. I knew the guy's name. It's like, you know, the educational something, something, you know, it's like, yeah, bullshit. That's the museum. Wrote that story. And the next day it was like, you know, come into the editor. So you want to work here? So, you know, I mean, my insight and my go, oh, like, oh, that's bullshit. Or, oh, go look here. Or also using it as an editor to evaluate uh, the story as it comes in. You know, the, 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 how good either A, the story is, or B, um, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? The, how good the sourcing is. I mean, sometimes a reporter called me. I know they was reading this off the of chief's desk. I know that some 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 detective somewhere just handed him this, and he's reading, standing there reading it in front of the detective. It's like, so I know I it gave me an extra little bit of bullshit detection that the, uh, you know, where I it wasn't quite ready to go down the, uh, uh, the, the, the 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 briar path, you know. Another one was uh, I looked and uh, you know then they used to publish the uh, uh, the orders. They used to actually send out on an email. DCPI would send out. The, the personnel moves, you know, suspensions and and uh, modifieds. And I see a sergeant is, is suspended for insubordination. And it's like, what the fuck? 
You know, if, if anybody's against insubordination, it should be sergeants. And it turns out, you know, he got into a, it was a great story. You know, it was like, you know, um, um, six time precinct at Canarsie, young black teenager, obviously young teenager comes in Saturday morning, she's in tears. She's supposed to take the, um, the SAT over at Bishop Ford High School. And uh, uh, so the desk officer calls in a car and says, the only, there's only one right answer here. So I get this kid to the SAT and says, take this kid, drive her all the way across Brooklyn and, uh, and uh, what do you call? Get it to the SAT on time. So there's only one right answer. They're all A. So um, they do this. The sergeant comes in and he's all pissed off. And I'm like, what? Well, some kind of fucking taxi service. And it's all, it's just like, like, calm down. Let's come into the lieutenant's locker room. And calm down, we'll talk about this. And when we get in there, he gets in the locker room. The sergeant actually takes off his gun belt and throws it on the table, which is an unmistakable offer of fisticuffs. I mean, that's all there is, you know. But again, just being able to see that, and it was a great story, fun story. But um, just being able to see that in the orders, that's how, that's what the eye, I had the eye for it. Because you say, okay, wait a second, you know. You know, it doesn't make me a genius. I just had inside information. So um, I, I do appreciate your time. Uh, let me ask you um, one other question. Kind of, What did you learn from in, in internal affairs? Well, and this was under Campisi um, or who? You know, yeah, Campisi, twice. But I didn't do wet work. You know, I was mostly the chief scribe. As some... Uh, as some um, uh, uh, lesser chief said haughtily once to me, and the chief, in front of the chief goes, well, what did you do here? And I said, well, I convert lies into elegant prose. You know, so I was mostly writing reports that you could do in, um, um, uh, uh, you know, that would go up, uh, you know, so I, you know, I did a lot of communications, but I did the long reports. And were you but shocked, um, the thing shocked was, at what you read and wrote? Or um, not, or was not it sort of your really you know, drunk driving, mean, you know, drunk driving well, domestic there, was some, there were some odds and ends. There were some odds and ends that were, you know, like, how could people do this? You know, but I was always worried about more about the proactive end of things. You see, when I was there, uh, I found that if somebody called the internal affairs and said, or called, you know, whatever, Drop the dime and says, Officer Moscow is doing this, that, and the other thing. You're going to get a full investigation, a thorough investigation, if need be, and financial surveillance, you name it. They're going to really look at this, of course, depending on where it is, you know. But uh, uh, the problem was, is like, what if nobody calls about Moscow? No way of knowing. No way of knowing. So, you know, I mean, you know, you try to recommend a few things, but sometimes, you know, you pick up a rock and you don't like what you see under there. So you say, Billy, don't pick up that rock anymore. You know, I had yeah. an idea where. I don't know if it, it reflects oh. well or poorly on a police department when like, you know, the NYPD arrests a lot of their own members every year, more than most people well, think. And I don't know if that's that good was or bad my, one of my ideas. That, but one of my ideas was. Um, uh, it was the reverse of that. So when you get arrested, you have a couple of phone calls, but they would put that on the online booking sheet. I don't know how it all works now. So I says, why don't we take those numbers that they call, run those numbers and see how many people say first calls to a cop? You know, and there's some interesting things come out of there. And it's like, yeah, we're not going to do that anymore. You know, because sometimes it's potentially embarrassing even outside the job. So it's like, yeah, let's, un you know. You know, the expression in the police department was if shit don't stink, don't kick it, you know? So. And was, know, was, I'm, that, I'm, I'm was, little, was that the dominant attitude or did in, in internal affairs at the time or? Um, there was cautious about how much scandal you could possibly um, afford public. I mean, I think that honestly, if guys, if guys fucked up, you know, they'd be happy to say, Put in your papers or, you know, get the fuck out before, you know, before the really bad shit happens to you. But, you know, there's only so much of this that we really want to air in public. You know, we could look stupid. I could look stupid. 
uh, my boss could look stupid, his boss could look stupid, and the guy across the street in City Hall could look stupid. So let's not let's save all these stupids and deal with it. Just deal with it. And I'm not saying brush it under the table, you know. Um, but uh, uh, you know, the idea is like let's handle it and get it done, and let's not over let's not overdo this. So. Hmm. Uh, um, but I think, I think, you know, I mean, I think essentially they're honest, you know, you know, uh, but again, the degrees of effectiveness, the degrees of what I would is, you know, uh, what's the line from Dr. Seuss? You know, it's a pretty good zoo, said young Gerald McGrew. You know, or, but basically if I were in the zoo, said young Gerald McGrew, I'd make a few changes. That's just what I'd do, you know, but, you know, God didn't choose me to be in charge of internal affairs. Can you think of any way to better red flag um, potentially problematic officers? Um, well, I've had a few ideas. None of them really came to anything because we never put them in into into. But it's just the idea of, you know, they're young, they're stupid, they love cars. Okay, how many cars are registered to this guy's house? This show might be his wife. His wife might be a doctor. Maybe she has a Maserati. I don't know. But if a guy's driving a Maserati to work, I want to know what the where, where the fuck that came from. Even though I wouldn't buy one. Anyway, um, you know, but I think there are ways to find out, uh, you know, even if you, you, you know, um, um, uh, you know, guys, guys are in debt. I don't understand why cops who are in debt want to steal. Because I have to tell you, um, you know, you just go bankrupt and nobody gets anything. Um, but the other thing is, is like, uh, and another thing is, is, a, is a, it's a philosophical preaching problem. Okay. So again, in the whole Catholic thing, we take cops about integrity, honesty, decency, you know, all of these concepts. Why don't we just teach them math? Okay. Here's how much money you make. Multiply that by 20. Half again for another 40 for the rest of your life. Here's how much insurance costs. Okay. Multiply it up by the entire rest of your life now, okay? So we're talking a package of eight, ten million dollars, maybe more, okay? So I'm going to take a, I'm going to gamble a hundred dollars against that. It's the stupidest fucking bet, and the possibility of jail, the possibility of not working. You know, I'm going to gamble with ten thousand dollars. The fuck, you got to, you got to be an idiot on this, you know? So the idea is like, let's just do the numbers. You know, never mind honesty and integrity. It, for whatever reason you don't take that money, that's your business. That's between you and God. But for me, you didn't take the money. I'm good. You know? <laughs> yeah, somebody once said you need a, a, a suitcase full of cash, two dead bodies in a parking garage, and, the, and like 10 more sacks for, you know. You got to do the math and like 5 million bucks. Maybe in that case, you're just taking it wrong. Right. You, you can invest the money and you say, okay, I'm better off with this money now. <laughs> okay. And that's where honesty and integrity come in. But right now, you know, but for anything, it's like, I, it's just fucking stupid. I don't understand. All right. You're going to have to do some bleeping on this one. Uh, there's going to be really no ble- cursing wild in the back half here. There, 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 in the beginning. There's no bleeping. <laughs> um, I, I will um, end this, which will be uh, the second part of a two part episode because we've gone on so for so long and I'm not cutting any of it. Um, so let me thank you very much. Um, I've been here with William Gorta, G-O-R-T-A, um, re- retired NYPD, uh, who was one of along of one of the people behind um, the implementation of Comstat uh, back in the uh, you know early early mid 1990s and um, it's it's always great to talk to you Billy um, and let me um, thank everybody for uh, for listening I hope you've enjoyed it this has been uh, any closing comments before I sign off no I'm all good thanks for having me on all right um, this has been quality policing I am Peter Moscos thanks for listening All right. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for having me on.